And we are back with another exciting installment of Newsmakers here with Summit.News with me, Paul Joseph Watson. And I'm joined by the host of Delling Pod podcast on Apple, also London Calling podcast, another excellent listen. The website is dellingpollworld.com. All these links will be in the description, as well as another title that he's assumed, which is President-Elect, which is a title that several people have assumed over the past few days. <laughs> and according to Donald Trump himself, Britain's best pollster. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that later in the interview. James Dellingpoll, welcome. Paul, it's so good to be on your show. I, I, it's a long time since I saw you. It's good to be back. Good to have you. Appreciate it. Now we're talking about the Great Reset, and you wrote this article for Breitbart. I think it was about 10 days ago now, but it was a big article. Title, Only Donald Trump Can Save Us From The Great Reset. Let's set the table here. We've talked about this many times on the show. What is The Great Reset? Who is behind it? And how will it impact our lives if, God forbid, it's implemented? Yeah, The Great Reset sounds, if you don't know, if, if you've kind of half heard of it, it sounds like one of those tinfoil hat conspiracy theories that couldn't possibly be real. But to, to all those people who think that, I'd say it's not a conspiracy if they're telling you what they're doing. The Great Reset is the brainchild of a guy called Klaus Schwab. He looks like a like a Bond villain. He's he's a a, 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 a German or a Swiss in his H's H's now. Uh, he's 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 bald and he, he talks in this slightly sinister German accent. Sounds and he's like the Dr. guy Strangelove. who invented. He is like Doctor Strange. He, well, he's like <laughs> Blofeld actually. He needs he needs to get himself a cat. If he hasn't got a, got a furry Persian cat, he needs to get one sharpish because he it would be a good look for him. So this guy many years ago he found this he founded this this thing called the World Economic Forum, which we probably know better as Davos. And Davos is not some conspiracy theory. Davos, as we all know, because we see it in the newspapers and on our screens every year, is the place that the, the global elite fly to in order to discuss how to how we little people should live. It's sometimes been, been described as the place where billionaires go to le lecture millionaires on how ordinary people should live. And Klaus Schwab is the guy who, who uh, devised this whole enterprise. And it, it's been very successful. I mean, you know, even... Even the president of the USA goes there. All the world leaders go there. They all appear on its panels. So it's not some kind of two-bit irrelevant organization. Davos is real. And so is the Great Reset real because it is what Klaus Schwab, the guy behind Davos, talks about all the time and has been for years. I mean, it's not a new thing that sprung out of the air in 2020, admittedly. This year, he's decided to take advantage of the COVID-19 alleged pandemic by, by deploying that as an argument as to why the, the Great Reset is more urgent than ever. But he was talking mm. about it in 2016. He was talking about it over the decades before. And what it is, basically, is another variation on the theme of the new world order. It's, it's techno a technocratic elite an unelected technocratic elite deciding how you and I should live our lives. It's about things like sustainability. In other words, forcing us to use expensive uh, bat and bird killing renewable energy rather than cheap, abundant fossil fuel energy. In fact, if you want to go really far down the rabbit hole, Paul, you can talk about the whole concept of technocracy. Technocracy, ultimately, the, the game plan is to replace currencies, fiat or otherwise, with a, a world modelled and, and decided uh, by these experts on the lines of energy. It's about energy rationing. But maybe that's too complicated to go. go I mean, you know, we'd need all day to go to, to talk about that. But essentially, it is another another way of of unelected technocrats, bureaucrats, telling us what to do and, and taking over our lives. And you talked about the um, the energy aspect of it there. A, a key integral part of this yes. agenda from their own words is 
the elimination of the car, the elimination of private property. In fact, in the article, you quoted them from 2016. As he said, this is not a 2020 COVID-19 plan. They've been planning this for years. World Economic Forum 2016, yeah. quote, welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city, or should I say our city? I don't own anything. <laughs> I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or clothes. They're doing this in the name of, you know, the global redistribution of wealth, which has proved fantastically successful every time it's been tried in history, right? But it's in the name of alleviating poverty and fixing wealth inequality. Are they really planning to redistribute the wealth fairly? Or is it once again about this concentration of power, this concentration of money into the hands of the few, which only actually serves to disenfranchise the masses and create this kind of new surf class on a you know a, a neo feudalist plantation essentially. I don't know why you're being so negative, Paul. I mean, imagine <laughs> no possessions. It isn't hard to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I the mean, the, there have always been dream, right? throughout history. Yeah. There have been useful idiots in our popular culture who've said, yeah, wouldn't it be great if nobody owned anything? Except, of course, John Lennon sang that song in a bloody enormous mansion with a, an enormous <laughs> white grand piano. Uh, so so one Easy rule for him, for him another for everyone else. And that, it, It's interesting, isn't it, that that um, that thing you, you quoted from 2016, where this bright-eyed, uh, what would he be, millennial, I suppose, talking about this golden future where he doesn't own anything, he doesn't have property. Well, hang on a second. If he doesn't have own property, presumably this property is being rented out to him by somebody. So who does own this property? Who who are these shadowy figures who are are somehow exempt from this new ruling where you don't own property? How does that work out? Somebody somebody is 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 telling Porky Pies here because it's clearly not going to be a world where nobody owns anything. Somebody's going to have all the concentrated power, and I would suspect it's going to be probably the billionaires who go to Davos. These people like what who. Bill Gates would be an obvious one. I imagine George Soros would be another. So all these disgusting people are going to get even more disgusting in the future. They're going to completely own our asses, and we're supposed to be grateful for it. Well, I, count me out of that of that 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 uh, utopian fantasy. It sounds like a nightmare to me. But the the way they're carrying this message through, James, is you know we've had numerous polls over the past couple of years that show alarmingly high levels of young people who support and endorse socialism and communism because they're not financially invested in society. You know, home ownership amongst millennials continues to fall. It has done for years and years and years. But again, that's because of the very same financial elite that's launching this great reset. They created the inflationary debt-driven economic policies that created that vacuum in terms of millennials not being able to afford home ownership. And then you tie it into the whole COVID thing, which I want to do now. You know, we had a story yesterday, Ticketmaster announced that people would have to prove that they've been vaccinated. This sounds like something Alex Jones would say 10 years ago. Now it's happening once again. They would have to prove they would have, have yeah. been vaccinated with the COVID vaccine via an app before being allowed to buy concert tickets. We've got Uber refusing to uh, provide service to people who don't wear masks. Now we've got advisors to the British government talking about handing out COVID free bracelets to give permission to those who comply to go about their business. What does all this mean for those of us, James? who may not want to get the vaccine, may not want to wear the bracelet, may not want to comply. You know, is this going to be enforceable? Is it going to be feasible to enforce this if enough people in the United Kingdom and elsewhere don't comply? Uh, look, to put it another way, of course it's going to be enforceable unless enough of us resist. I mean, look, Ticketmaster will get away with this devilish plan to 
to uh, force us to take this potentially dangerous vaccine, if we let them get away with it, if we go on buying tickets through Ticketmaster, then that's going to send a market signal. I mean, I believe in markets. I don't know about you. I think markets are the fairest way of allocated, allocating re scarce resources. We, we'll never find a better one than markets. I mean, markets are, are not controlled by the government or shouldn't be. They're a free exchange of, of, between two parties. If if we do not send that signal to Ticketmaster, then Ticketmaster will own us. Ticketmaster will, be, will become part of that shadowy elite which is controlling our lives. We can resist at this point, but each day that goes by that we accept this stuff and, and we don't resist, each day that we carry on taking Ubers when they impose this ridiculous mask uh, imposition on us, uh, then we are going to be given, giving more power to these very, very dangerous people. So we have to start resisting now. And I mean, as you, you make the point in your article and I've read elsewhere, these people are the same people that launched the global warming scare back in the late 80s, early 90s. It's literally in many cases, the same scientists advising our government on COVID-19 that wrote the fake discredited IPCC reports. And in fact, this is a quote from the Club of Rome founder, which was an integral uh, front for that global warming scaremongering agenda from back in 1993. This was Alexander King. He wrote the first global revolution. Talking about global warming, he stated, quote, the common enemy of humanity is man. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill, which sounds very similar in terms of identifying humanity itself as the enemy with, of course, the, uh, the super spreaders of COVID. And in fact, uh, Klaus Schwab's book, wherein he says it's not an existential threat. He's talking about COVID. It's not an existential threat. Mirrors almost directly the rhetoric of the Club of Rome when they were trying to sell humanity on giving up their freedoms to save the planet. And that makes sense, James. Because it's the same people doing it, right? It's just a rebrand of the new world order. The, a lot of what's happened this year will have come as no surprise to those of us who have been following things like what used to be called the United Nations Agenda 21 and has now been rebranded Agenda 2030. That um, the, 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 the MO, the modus operandi of the of the the junk scientists pushing the coronavirus scare is exactly the same mo of the junk scientists pushing the fake scare about climate change climate change was a kind of handy pseudo scientific excuse for transforming the world economy in the interests of this same shadowy elite and it's not a conspiracy theory. I mean, one of, when I wrote a book about this 10 years ago, a book called Watermelons, you know, green on the outside, red on the inside, I, I set out to answer the question, why, if, if global warming isn't really a problem, if, if man, mankind isn't contributing dangerously to, to global warming through his, through his carbon dioxide emissions, then why would so many people, so many different sources claim that it is why would the scientists be saying this why would the the ngos be saying this why would politicians be going along with this why would businesses be be going along with this and the answer is that it's a kind of concatenation of of shared interests they all have a it's not a conspiracy so much as a it suits them all to aim for this goal because ultimately what they want to do is gain more power over the rest of us the climate change thing was just a, a a convenient excuse, but then a better one came along in the form of COVID-19. And in a way, I think that what's happened this year, the way that people have often proved so credulous in the face of, of, of this, the, what is in fact just like a, a, a dose of bad flu, it's, it's certainly no more... <coughs> No more fatal and 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 uh, deadly than say the Hong Kong flu of of 1968 or um, 
even in the in the in the winter of 2017 2018 i think that the excess winter winter deaths in the united kingdom were were about 50,000 so you know about the same that has that has died of or with with coronavirus. Well, we didn't shut down the economy in 2017, 2018 to deal with the flu of that year. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that that people have have bought into the the government scientist scare story far too readily. And I think the reason for that is that they've been softened up over a period of decades. I mean, since you could argue at least the Rio Earth Summit of, of 1992. So that's uh, 1992 what was that uh, 30 years ago almost so people have been been bombarded with information about how the world is doomed it's all our fault we've got to end our ways we've got to change our behavior because the the the, the, the old normal cannot be allowed to exist anymore we have to have a new normal and people have been buying into this stuff because they they kind of used to the idea now that scientists know better than they do what to do. Scientists are experts, and of course, scientists are the same kind of technocrats that that, that the people of, from the technocracy cult worship. Scientists apparently know better than anybody else, better than better than you or I, how we should spend our daily budget, how we should allocate our, our resources, what we should need in our daily lives, whether or not we need to fly, whether or not we need to, to, to drive, et cetera, et cetera. We have become sort of willing dupes of this of this technocratic elite. And I think that it's time that we started resisting. Yeah, and you, you talked about their you know, they had a better excuse and more people bought into it compared to global warming. And that's borne out by the polls. Of course, you have a disconnect whereby there are polls that say, for example, in the UK, only 18 percent of people are complying with self-isolation. And I believe that figure went even down more recently. But then you had another survey, which I've talked about many times. It didn't get much press attention. They did a survey in numerous major Western countries and in the UK, and this was mirrored throughout the Western world, they they found that the average Brit, this is the average Brit, thought five million people in the UK alone had died from coronavirus. Now, of course, the actual figure, and that includes the people with comorbidities who would have unfortunately died anyway in the weeks or months that followed, the actual figure is 50,000. So what does it say about the power of media hysteria? Because that's the only thing I can imagine it's based on, that Brits literally think a hundred times more people have died from COVID-19 than is actually the case. Yeah, I, I, I sometimes refer to this year, Paul, as, as the perfect storm of stupid, because there have been so many currents leading up to this. It's like kind of it's it, all the currents have joined up to, to meet like a sort of massive festering boil which is finally burst in our faces so you've got things like the 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 junk science establishment which i've i've already already mentioned you've got years of dumbing down of the education system under people like under people like tony blair you've got uh again tony blair's fault the creation of this university system whereby 50 percent of the youth population goes to uni to to do their worthless degrees in kind of my little pony studies with with advanced poi and windsurfing and and these th this th th these kids come out of university thinking well hey i went to uni i'm really bright i know my shit and in fact they really, really don't. They've got this half baked, these half baked ideas about how science works, and they think, yeah, trust the science scientists. I listen to programs on Radio Four every week on BBC Radio, telling me that scientists are these really clever, clever people. And then you have these kind of wacky BBC approved scientists like uh, what's that pouty mouthed um, astronomer bloke, you know, who's got a right, northern Cox. accent, um, uh, you know, the yeah, exactly. And and Brian Cox. He tells you that global warming is definitely happening and he looks kind of sexy and he's got he's got big lips and he used to be in a he used to be in a band called Dream. So. So, hey, he's got youth credibility looks and he's got an astronomy degree or physics or something. So he must know what he's talking about if he says global warming is real. You, you see what I'm getting at? There's a sort of sort of a combination of absolute ignorance and at the same time uh, outrageous self self-belief outrageous 
false intellectual confidence, which leads people into, into thinking they know stuff which they simply don't. Um, it, it's, the, the, I'm sure if you asked a lot of people, they would tell you, for example, that, yeah, uh, you realize that, that even if you've had coronavirus, you can still get it again. Because apparently there have been about three cases in the, in the entire world out of about, you know, God knows how many million where this has happened. And, and yeah, and apparently the antibodies, you know, the antibodies don't last long. Well, these people don't know about T cell immunity they, because, because they've been given this partial information. By, by charlatans like Neil Ferguson, the guy from Imperial College, and, and um, the, the, the chief medical officer, Chris Whitless, who was at school with me, by the way. I mean, he was an absolute non-entity. He was going nowhere. And suddenly, this guy from school, this boring guy from my school, who, who, who shouldn't be running a bath, let alone the country, this guy is now our chief medical officer, saying that unless we lock down more, we're, going to, we're all going to die. It's 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 really we are living many, in many crazy, such crazy cases, times, James, Paul. where these people are complete non-entities in school or university, sometimes get bullied and then have their revenge on society later on. Many such cases. It's, Let's talk about the UK, though. Don't blame me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yesterday, I, didn't, I, didn't, UK, I didn't bully him at school, I promise. All right. <laughs> I believe you. OK, so yesterday in the UK, 595 coronavirus deaths yesterday in Sweden. 10 coronavirus deaths. Now, of course, the population of the UK is six times higher, but that difference is still substantial. Now we have the situation where we're facing this second lockdown, and this is what they do time and time again. They get up in these government press conferences with all their fancy graphs, which then get pulled apart within hours by actual experts. They get up there and say, there are gonna be 4,000 deaths per day if we don't do this lockdown, and then maybe we'll have another lockdown after that. There'll be 4,000 deaths a day. Then when it's below that number, which it always is, it was the previous occasion because the deaths were already falling before the first lockdown, they come out and say, oh, look, we were right. The lockdown worked. We didn't have 4,000 deaths per day. And maybe we'll let you go to the pub yeah. for another few weeks and then we'll have another lockdown. How many rolling lockdowns are people gonna tolerate, for example, before, as a couple of police chiefs predicted last week, we start to see really kind of intensified civil unrest. We've seen protests, massive protests in uh, Germany. We've seen sporadic protests in the UK, in Manchester and other cities. They're talking about having police go into people's houses on Christmas day to break up family gatherings. This is the problem the government has, James. They can only enforce the most draconian end of these uh, coronavirus restrictions if they become way more police state in, uh, in terms of activating the police to actually enforce them, which at the moment doesn't seem to be the case. Do you think the government's going to get way more draconian or do they fear actual civil unrest and they're going to kind of have this system where it's not really being enforced at the moment? It's, it's a complicated one. I, do you remember near the beginning of the... Of, of lockdown when Boris went on TV and and this was this was the, the time when he was still going through that phase where he kept reassuring us and his and his um, spin doctors kept reassuring us how how reluctant Boris was to do this because his natural instincts were libertarian and 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 it and and Boris sort of made out you know I'm I'm a I'm a lovely chap that you can really trust and and you can relate I can relate to you you're you're doing a splendid job and and, and it won't be long and it's all very necessary and. And we all sort of thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe this is necessary. But Boris said not long afterwards that he was he was surprised by how compliant the country was, how easy it was to get people to mm. put themselves under house arrest, which I don't think it's ever happened before in history. I don't think ever that that any government has told a healthy populace that they've got to stay at home um, except to do their shopping for a period of, what was it? It was several weeks. I mean, it's never happened. And look how easily we obeyed. Now, I've noticed since that 
the government, the, the policing has got a lot more aggressive, not towards things like Black Lives Matter, not towards, I mean, you remember in Bristol, for example, it was perfectly possible for a mob to drag down a piece of the city's architecture, a, a statue that they didn't like, to drag it with ropes through the streets to the city's docks and and dump it in the in 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 the river. Well, I mean that is an act of vandalism, regardless of whether or not you think that the statue of Edward Colston w- was a good thing or a bad thing. It is not up to mobs in broad daylight to pull down statues and drag them into the river. And yet they did this under the noses of an approving local police. Um, we saw similar similar scenes, not not quite dragged into the into the, the Thames, but we saw similar scenes in, in London with both Black Lives Matter and, of course, Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion closed down areas of London for days at a time. They 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 um, closed down a, a bridge, didn't they? And 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 one of the policemen sort of showed how down he was with the Extinction Rebellion uh, protesters by showing his skateboarding skills. And, you know, it was clear <laughs> that the police kind of kind of thought it was amusing and charming that 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 they could work hand in hand with these with with Swampy and Co. Meanwhile, but they're grabbing when women it comes at anti-lockdown protests and throwing them down on the street and just getting away with it. And no really, one cares, right? Really, scarily, scarily aggressive. So how do you explain these double standards? The government does not want its authority challenged on the subject of these draconian lockdowns, which does make you wonder, I mean, and it's a question we should all be asking every day, why are they doing this? Because the scientific evidence does not support what they're doing. I mean, you listen to one of my podcasts with Mike Mike Yeadon, Dr. Mike Yeadon. Mike Mike was worked in the pharmaceuticals industry for thirty years. He 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 specialises in respiratory infections. That was where what his doctoral training was in. He tells us, look, we've pretty much got herd immunity already. That that our T cell immunity uh, from Previous coronaviruses from from SARS one has given a, a maybe thirty percent of the of the of the population a natural immunity. A, another chunk of the population has acquired that uh, immunity by being exposed to COVID. I mean, I've had coronavirus. I've I presumably got the well, I've definitely got the immunity now. Uh, children are immune anyway, to all intents and purposes. So only a fraction of the population now is vulnerable, and yet we've got. The government and their very dodgy, dodgy advisors insisting that, no, we're still all in danger. More must be done. There must be more draconian measures. It can't end. That's that's very scary when it when junk science is being enforced by a an aggressive police. That I mean, it's it's a form of of of, of scientific, well, junk scientific tyranny that's being imposed on us, isn't it? Yeah, and a few days ago, you had another, uh, on the back of the great Barrington Declaration, you had another, what was it, 500 top expert scientists come out and say, Boris, you need to reverse course. And just time and time again, they ignore them. The only conclusion you can make is that they're marching to the tune of a higher power, and that higher power is the great reset, is this globalist agenda. Final question, though, James, because I know you've got to get off, but we talked about on the show few days ago, this archbishop, and indeed you mentioned this in your article, bringing it back to your Breitbart article, this is Carlo Maria Vigano. And this is not some obscure figure. This guy was uh, fundamental in exposing the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Church, other financial corruption. By the way, he calls out Pope Francis to be a complete globalist sellout, which he is. He wrote this open letter to Trump calling him the final garrison in stopping the Great Reset. He said, quote, this historical moment sees the forces of evil aligned in a battle without quarter against the forces of good. So from a broader perspective, outside of the uh, the agenda, the elites lust for raw power. Is it accurate to frame this whole scenario in this key integral time at the point of world history as more of a, in the words of the archbishop, a spiritual battle? Unquestionably. Paul, this is uh, this is Armageddon. 
this is the final battle between good and evil, or certainly as far as I, this is our, our our World War Two or anything you you know, however you want to couch it. It is our epic struggle, and if we lose this one, our way of life is going to be changed forever for the worse. You know, we're going to be stuck in this in this new normal, which is going to be to none of our liking. And I do genuinely believe that 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 Donald Trump is our only hope. This this struggle is essentially between the nationalists represented by Donald Trump and Bolsonaro and a few others and the globalists. And it's not as though the globalists have been around with 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 their particular technocratic philosophy, which is a kind of form of global fascism or communism, if you like. It's really it's another totalitarian movement which which turns us all into serfs. Um, these people have been saying this stuff for a very, very long time. And and it's it's slowly kind of seeped its way into our culture, often through local government particularly. But the fact that these people have been saying it for a long time and that it hasn't been introduced yet is not a sign that we should go, well, they don't really mean it. They, it it's all toothless. It's all it's all just a fantasy. All it means is, is that they haven't yet found a way of implementing it. It doesn't mean that there are not loads of people out there determined to do so. You know, Christina Figueres from the United Nations, she's absolutely committed to doing this. We look at look at look at Boris Johnson, look at his pronouncements. Look at look at Joe Biden's pronouncement. Joe Biden made his campaign slogan Build Back Better, which is the slogan of the New World Order of of the Great Reset. I mean Klaus Schwab is constantly talking about build back better. Um, Boris Johnson uses it. Uh, Pierre uh, uh, what's, Justin Trudeau uses it all the time. A lot of a lot of people in positions of power are completely on board with this with this great reset. So we shouldn't dismiss it as just the kind of some wacky thing that a few weird people have mentioned on the internet, which can't be real. The great reset is real, and if we allow them to implement it, it will happen. So we have to take it seriously, and we have to resist now. And of course, Biden's transition team is openly proposing a new lockdown in America. That transition team comprises stooges of arms dealers, lobbyists and Wall Street bankers. So apparently that's that's the resistance that's going to save us from Trump. It's not over until the fat lady sings, though, as you point out in your article. But James, we're going to leave it there. But before we go, tell people how they can find your podcast and your work online. Well, Paul, in all modesty, I have to say that my podcast is about the best in the world. Um, it's got <laughs> conversations with amazingly interesting people, and and of course, it is not it is not um, it, it is not part of the global uh, the great reset. It's the it's the resistance. Um, you can find it on my my website, which is there are links to it at dellingpoleworld.com. I, I'm spelled D E L I N G P O L E, not not with any more L's than that. Dellingpoleworld.com. You can find me on YouTube. You can support me on Patreon. Patreon or subscribe star and um i'm on apple yeah the delling pod it's called d-e-l-i-n-g-p-o-d and i hope you'll listen to it i think you'll like it okay we're going to leave it there all those links will be in the description below but for the time being james delling paul right. thanks for joining us today really appreciate it thank you thanks paul